sitting in your easy chair, looking at a picture in a frame. You have a jester in your room, a child for two. Happy to play your idle hours away. There's people and places and scores of new exciting faces and people you know on television. I love the fact that we're young, we're female, quite pretty, you know, not too offensive on the eye, yet we can still have an opinion. On television. I think girls behaving badly has always been a great theme of film and television. If you go back to Mae West or Whatever. Girls Behaving Badly is enjoyable to watch, it's enjoyable to do, and it's enjoyable for really big audiences. Well, I didn't go into television because how women were on TV. I went into television because it was a growth industry and I could do a lot of creative work and I never even saw any problem with being a woman, to be perfectly honest. There weren't really any women on screen apart from very decorative props in light entertainment. You'd get sort of conjurer's assistant type women wearing glamorous things and agreeing to be sawn in half. I mean, I can remember my early days of filming. I was always the one who carried the tripod because I didn't think I should expect other people to do things that I wasn't prepared to do myself. Television. This is the switchboard of Picture Page, a topical magazine introducing visitors, types, and personality. You're through. Yes, the war is over, and it's the date for which so many of us have been waiting for so long. And though Elizabeth Cowell is no longer with us, Jasmine Bly is back to reopen the television service. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Do you remember me, Jasmine Bly? Well, here we are after a lapse of nearly seven years, ready to start again. And of course, we're always terribly excited and thrilled that the great day has at last arrived when this station is once more ready to go on the air. Artists, cameramen, producers, scene men, and all sorts of people are here ready to make this afternoon's program. The threads, rather dusty perhaps, are picked up once more. Alexandra Palace is on its feet again. I was employed as junior assistant and the person who was in charge of what was to become, to the best of my knowledge, the first television library in the world was Irene Thornley, who was also working for Middlesex County Libraries at the time. Now, because the room wasn't ready for us at Alexandra Palace, we started our working life in July 46 at Broadcasting House. Miss Milnes was in charge and she was a very formidable lady but she had very high standards and she was a wonderful person to work for. Before I went, Miss Milnes called me into the office and said, Now, dear, I want no lessening of standards when you get up to the palace. No turning up in slacks or headscarves. I expect my girls to wear a hat. We were in the same room with the gramophone library run by John Carter, who played records for Jane Eyre when Harold Clayton was doing a production, and that was the Mad Woman Screams, so it was rather difficult to hear queries. ...aid the British radio industry in installing and in demonstrating television receivers. You radio men, who will be seeing it day by day throughout the year, will soon anticipate each pictorial change and will know the music and dialogue by heart. To you, we would say that we shall modify it from time to time, and that the stop press items should always prove interesting. When I joined the BBC when I was 17, um, I had an interview with a very nice lady um, called Caroline Towler. I remember I had to wear a hat and um, gloves. Nobody came into a particular job. 
You had what I suppose you would now call an induction course um, at Bedford College. And the sort of head of that was a lady, Margaret Darcy. Very lady, very, very Margaret and very Darcy. <laughs> um, and uh, when we'd done that, we then all went to an enormous room in what used to be the Langham Hotel. Um, it's called General Office, and we were under Miss Leonard, the General Office Supervisor. I lived in a hostel, that's right, in Mortimer Street, just round the corner from, from BH. Um, Yvonne Littlewood was there at the same time, and I remember Yvonne um, playing the piano in a rather solemn way in what we used to call the workroom. It was a funny sort of workroom, you know, with one grill and an iron, and um, you could do a bit of dressmaking and play the piano and generally muck about. It, and we always used to do that on a Saturday afternoon. Because we, we had lunch, but that was the last meal. And so we were allowed to use the single gas ring, you see, and do what we could for the, for the last meal of the day. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Design for Women, that takes us back too. That was in 1947, and it was rather fun to be associated with it. I was the compere, Mary Adams was the producer. She's now a terribly, terribly important person in, in the BBC. Uh, but it was her idea that women might like an afternoon programme. The first slot was called Mainly for Women, and within that slot, a number of programmes came up with their own titles. We had the first series called Design for Women, um, which was started by Mary Adams, who was a Cambridge graduate. She'd worked in the Ministry of Information during the wartime, and she later became head of talks, of course, uh, in the BBC. And she had this idea that um, a magazine programme directed towards women um, should focus on practical interests, practical domestic interests. And she had the four C's there, cookery, children, clothes, and celebrities. And those four elements, I think, have remained in women's programmes and in daytime programming ever since. She thought it was very important to uh, build up a relationship of confidence with the audience and to draw in the audience. And in order to do that, um, she had uh, a presenter uh, who would link the items together. And uh, Jeanne Heal was one of the first in that respect. She was allowed to speak direct to camera, so she had that privilege, which is normally reserved for the monarchy, politicians, and newsreaders, of course. Mary Adams was always keen that women should get ahead and do well. Um, and she was responsible for bringing in uh, or making certain that there were uh, jobs offered for people to do different kinds of things, children's programs, uh, programs in the afternoon that were concerned with leisure activities. Uh, th these were all things that, that Mary Adams started and found appropriate people uh, to uh, take charge of. Doreen Stevens was in charge of the afternoon programs and Frida Lindstrom was in charge of the children's programmes. She herself was concerned largely with puppet programmes. We get out of the studios into the outside world, not only by using film material, but also by actually taking television cameras on outside broadcasts. So now I'm going to hand you over to the outside broadcast department. The one department that tended to have very few women was the OB department. A lot of them had been fighter pilots in the RAF before joining the television service. And in some ways, you needed the same kind of qualities for a good director of a live television program. Next month. Barry, you'll be doing your preliminary arrangements for those two. They're both all right? Yes, that's all tied up. Good. Then we come to the fire display. Richard, I believe you're going to do the commentary for that and discuss the details with uh, Barry this morning. Yes, it's in the Dimbleby diary. Excellent. And now we come to Zoo. Uh, Keith, I'd like you to move that forward one week, if you 
can. Can you manage it? Yes, I think I can. Excuse right. me, Keith. Peter, if you finish with me, I think I'll push off to Speedway. Right, I'll be down about half past four. Funny Listen, enough, when I first went, um, there were women in quite high positions at the BBC, and it was one of the few companies that, that right. allowed women to get You're into right, important yes. positions. Mm. I mean, for instance, they had two female announcers to one male. And, I mean, we did everything. We did the important occasions. The only thing they wouldn't let us oh, do yes. was read the news, but that hadn't arisen in our days, had no, it? No. And then, I mean, there were afternoon programmes and you found yourself uh, helping um, Jean Hill with a fashion show or helping um, the television cook with the batter for the pancakes. I mean, you never really quite knew that was the fun of it, wasn't it? Yes, well, we, we were in with all the programmes. Yeah, that's exactly. what was so lovely. Everybody mucked in and it was a lovely, very, very nice sort of feel about the place. You could look somewhere quite different this time, Luby Lou. <laughs> Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home, bringing their tails behind them. They went back in such a hurry, one didn't look where he was going and he jumped into the wrong flower pot. And although they both tried to settle down, there really wasn't room for the two of them. Lord, up, up, Rob. Sweet. That's why we want this pastry fairly firm. There's a, a story in Cornwall that a, a pasty should be, a perfect pasty, should be so tough that it should be possible to drop it down a tin mine without it breaking. Well, that's a counsel of perfection which, for gastronomic reasons, one needn't take too literally. Well, now, as you may know, South End has a carnival today, an enormous four-mile-long procession which marks the beginning of ten days of special festivities. Well, we started off being very poor, and we had to wear some of our own clothes, and then we had things out of wardrobe, but eventually we got a marvellous dress allowance. And we went to the London Fashion House Group, was it? Was yeah. it the London Fashion yeah. House Group? And it had lovely clothes every season, and we used to have glamorous jewellery, great drop earrings and the lot, which we borrowed from... Um, a lovely firm in London called Paris House. So the image, funnily enough, was incredibly glamorous. We had to mm. change into full evening dress for the evening programme. Yeah. At the same time being rather matey and friends of the public sort of thing. I'll come when you call When you give me the speed of a bird I will fly to your side I'll come when you call when I know you are near and as soon as I hear I will run Sylvia well, I got married while I was yes. there. Yes, the only rule I do remember, first of all, you were not allowed to work with your husband or wife. And actually that didn't really arise because my husband was sort of a floor manager and then a director and I was mostly presentation. Um, but I do remember that we had a week's marriage leave each, but we had two separate weeks at two different times of the year. All taken out of your holiday. Out of the dance. annual leave, yes, yes. exactly. Yes, oh, yes, yes. 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 Yes, and he used to get things like the girlfriend of the producer could be starring in his show. But if you were the wife, you, he wasn't allowed to book you. You oh, know. Yes. And now, children, it's time for us to return to the studio. Good night, everybody, from Sutton Cofield, and good viewing. Cut to four. Seventeen. Take out three. The cat's riding on another shot. Lift the boom. Mary Adams was eventually one of the assistant controllers of the BBC, which was a, a pretty senior position. The BBC was a much smaller operation at that time. But the person who was most important, really, was a woman called Grace Wyndham Goldie, who, was, who came in from radio. And it was she who really formed political broadcasting, political television, as we know it. I mean, Grace Wyndham Goldie was one of the most important people in the history of television, not only in the history of 
women in television. And when Grace arrived, she was given an office on the drama corridor with two telephones. And both John Glyn Jones and Eric Fawcett were furious because they'd only got one. And here was this interloper from Broadcasting House who was coming in and had got two telephones to begin with. But it was like our carpet in the library. Materials were short, so people did take notice. But it, it was empty rather than anything vicious. But it, it did add the spice to life a little. Grace Wyndham Goldie was a great trainer of young people. And she surrounded herself with a group of very bright young men. Grace's boys, they became known as. And many of them went on to become directors general, program controllers, people eminent in the British media. But unfortunately, no young women. She, was, she did not open spaces for women to follow in her footsteps. She was, um, she was the Margaret Thatcher of the BBC, I'm afraid, at that time. You see, in the 50s, politicians weren't particularly interested in television. All the, all the work, all the influence went to radio. That was Reith's legacy. That's what he saw as the strength of the BBC. Radio, television was just some little entertainment attached. But Grace saw that you could actually take hold of television and use it for, as a serious uh, new journalistic commentary on the way the world was. And she persuaded politicians that that was so. That was a major achievement. 1950. Television changes its London home. The two cramped studios at Alexandra Palace are replaced by a block of studios at Shepherd's Bush, seven times as large. Well, it's the biggest ever yet as far as uh, election results are concerned. It's far bigger even than in 1955 when we had a total uh, number of television cameras, which were 37 on this occasion. We're using 57 uh, cameras, what with the studio, and cameras all over the country, including a great number in the actual counts. Day of the Coronation was the first time that we had a bigger audience than the radio audience. And then we were sort of one up on radio after that. Over 20 million people in Great Britain viewed it direct. Another million and a half on the continent. I mean, we were all enchanted with the whole thing and Richard Dimpleby and everything. And it just changed everything because mm. television overnight became what everybody wanted in their home. So that was when I think we got a bit more money for clothes. Yes, it all did, started yes. to grow from the there. two little Cinderella's got something more. Yes, exactly. I had to pay the contributors after they'd taken part in the programme. They were paid three guineas in cash. I had to sort of lurk about behind the scenery and hand them the three guineas and whisper and ask them to sign a receipt. Then, at some point when I was working there, um, a vacancy came up for a producer's secretary for a producer called Carol Doncaster. Now, the producer's secretaries were, on the whole, rather formidable older women and I was quite lucky really to get the job and I, I think I mainly got it because Carol was rather fierce and a lot of people were frightened of her <laughs> nobody really wanted to go and work with her so um, uh, anyway I got the job she pioneered television drama documentaries her sort of biggest piece of work was a series called um, The Pattern of Marriage which sought to look into the difficulties facing young couples setting up on their own and making a successful relationship and um, this turned out to be quite a difficult area for her because it's, it's quite hard to realize now that a lot of what seemed to us perfectly ordinary subjects of discussion were simply completely taboo um, things like birth control and 
you know, the sexual side of marriage, I mean, were simply not allowed to be discussed in public. It is our desire and hope that in the years to come, we may preserve one of the proudest boasts of England, the rights of free speech, fair play, our own particular brand of decency and tolerance, our own particular brand of humor and common sense. Zero hour is on us. Commercial television is here. Armand and Michaela Dennis are in Africa now, making for us a new series of animal films. In Morning Magazine, Dione Lucas prepares something to make your mouth water. Our remotes units will bring you sporting events, theatres, exhibitions, anything of interest within the range of their links. That was um, 1955. I remember actually going to a meeting, uh, a public meeting about it. And uh, it wasn't very popular with some people. I know Miss Melms thought this was really not the way to behave, to have other people besides the BBC doing broadcasting. <laughs> I think ITV generally meant that there was more American influences on television in Britain as a whole. So that with ITV we get probably the first, what would re we would recognise now as a poet's soap, Emergency Ward 10, which had that very American com co combination of romance and personal relationships set in a hospital, so there was lots of life and death drama as well, lots of nurses and doctors getting together. Well, it was Tessa Diamond's original creation, but uh, she wasn't an experienced television writer. She came from the publicity department, but she had this very good idea, and she was a very good writer, but it, the pressure of keeping all that up was too much for one person, so they decided to bring in another writer and then more after that. You nearly finished, Mr. Marshall. You are so anxious to get rid of me, sister? Would I have coffee waiting for you in my office if I was? No, there's a visitor from Mr. Doyle. Well, at this time of day? Well, he hasn't got any family in this country, and it's the first visitor he's had. It's a fellow countryman, another sports reporter, name of Jim Singleton. Oh, indeed. Well, he says this is the only time he's got, so I'm stretching a point. Mr. Doyle, I bet you are. Your coffee's ready, Mr. Marshall. There was such a shortage of writers of any kind. They were so grateful to have scripts that you didn't feel you were battling. The only time one felt one was battling was when rediffusion started and the building works were going on. And I literally had, you know, a hole in the wall of the office I was sitting in and a workman walked through carrying a lavatory pan. And there was so much dust, we used to get a special cleaning allowance. Well, it all helps to get the rash down, doesn't it? My well, hand's quite clear now, isn't yes. it? Yes. I suppose if I obey orders, it'll stay clear. <coughs> Women's medical? Uh, yes, he is here. Would you hold on a minute, please? It's for you. Oh, thank you. Hello, Forrester here. Oh, uh, Caroline. Darling, I do wish you wouldn't ring me up in the ward. Farewell to cold winter. Summer's come at last. Nothing have I gained. But my true love I have lost I'll sing and I'll be happy Like the birds upon the tree For since he deceived me I care no more for he Let him go, let him tarry Let him sink or let him swim He doesn't care for me And I don't care for him He can go and The only area from which ITV could find reasonably trained staff was the BBC because there was no other television anywhere else. So they did, um, uh, they did take a few, you know, they lured them away with a nice, um, you know, financial carrot. Um, 
And so that was sad, I mean, but it also gave other people a chance to, um, you know, to train up and be re to replace them. Over the point, over the point, they started up a training school, and um, from time to time they took in people from outside, um, and they also took in staff who, who had a potential perhaps for directing and producing, so I went on that. Rolling and a rocking through the night. There was one person who had done a bit of production, and that was somebody called Josephine Douglas, who presented, along with Pete Murray, 6 5 Special. After that, Joe produced one or two shows. I, she did sort of forces programs for, I mean, we still had quite a lot of forces overseas and, um, and she, I think she did a couple of series, but it was fairly short lived and she left. I'm not quite sure what she went on to do. Um, so I was in fact the only woman producer for quite some time, which was kind of a pity, but that was the way it was. Why do men climb mountains? Because they're there. You know, I had more trouble paying out this rope than he had climbing up that sheer rock face. He said it was easy. And I must say it looked it when he did it. I was working for Cecil McGiven who was then deputy director of television. And he had his office, he had his own private, um, you know, lavatory and s small bathroom and so forth. He had his own drinks cupboard, which was really very exceptional. And it was done on the basis that he entertained artists. So therefore, it was a kind of green room, you see. And of course, one of the duties was to um, see that the drinks cupboard was uh, well supplied. And, um, Unfortunately, it needed to be, it finally needed to be done every day. And sometimes, of course, that he also smoked very heavily. And, and sometimes I'd really look at him very blackly and look at the sort of empty cupboard and so forth. And he'd say, uh, um, I w wonder where it's all gone. <laughs> and of course, it's very difficult to be tough on someone who does that. Because we really both knew, you see. And then when it got worse and he'd come in in the morning in a very dicky state, you know, one would try and get toast from the canteen and nurse him along a bit and keep people off and so forth. Um, but it was really a losing battle. In side television, there were a number of women working as secretaries to high executives, who, some of whom, in my opinion, could have done their boss's jobs perfectly well. Uh, and who were really quite remarkable, young women in the late 20s, early 30s, that sort of thing. Outside of that, uh, the women one came across were mostly presenters in television. Judith Chalmers and various others, there were about four of them. And they were used really, as you know, in between programmes to present programmes. Well, next Friday at 3 o'clock, we start a new series called Information Desk. And we're hoping that a lot of viewers are going to send us questions. Questions about anything at all, not troubles or... Not any, a heart problem. No, not a heart drop thing at all, no. Um, we're hoping they'll send us up quite a lot of questions. We will give them the answers, mm. if In we can. Information, but mainly entertainment. Oh, yes. Oh, entirely entertainment, yes. Well, I hope that you'll like television, and also, for your sake, the television likes you. Oh, I hope so. In the mid-50s, the arrival of ITV really shook up the BBC. Everyone was then on their mettle to get the bigger audience because for the first time, advertising was on the screen and the ITV had to get the audiences, so how to do that? And that was to steal the audience from the BBC. So suddenly there were lots of bright new ideas, which rather shook the BBC, who thought they'd got a monopoly and that their way of doing things was the accepted way. Not so. ITV m made the bold decision to have a woman read the news. That was Barbara Mandel, but she only did it at lunchtime. She wasn't given the um, status of the nine o'clock news or the ten o'clock news at ten. She was allowed to do it 
during the day. And that was a breakthrough of a kind. Good morning to you. Mr. McMillan, the Foreign Secretary, left London Airport this morning for Geneva, where the meeting of the four foreign ministers resumes today. With him, ITV also yeah, used Lynn Reed Banks as a reporter. Among a great many men, and, as it were, not a high-profile, conspicuous uh, triumph, but it was a change, and change was what mattered, and change was what the BBC had to acknowledge. Well, and what do you think of it? Now you're in. It feels absolutely delicious, like being in a washing machine. This feeling of being pummeled all over by little hammers, is that, uh, is that part of the treatment? Well, that really is the uh, best part of the treatment. It's the massage effect. I haven't got rheumatics, and I imagine quite a lot of people might come just because it feels nice, do they? One of the thoughts I had was that it might be a good idea to have a woman newsreader in television. Now, this was greeted by my editors with alarm, dismay and resistance. The thought that a woman could be a conveyor of truth and of authority on the television screen was something you couldn't imagine, couldn't accept. I was asked, stroke told, would I do the nine o'clock news on a Sunday night? And I didn't realise at the time what um, a revolutionary thing it was. I really didn't realise. But I did realise everybody was getting very excited about it. And I didn't have any trouble from the press or from the public. It was the editorial staff who were a bit dodgy. They were men in their middle years and they'd come from Fleet Street. And television was very new in those days and I don't think women reporters were too popular in Fleet Street. And they certainly were a bit ambivalent about me. At the beginning they thought they'd done terribly well. And then there's, there was a lot of criticism. Um, they were very, very serious about the news. I mean, much more serious than they'd been about London and the South East. This was very, very serious stuff. And then, of course, I was taken off it altogether and then put back on. And this doesn't increase one's confidence, really. And then, of course, the final axe by Michael Peacock, who called me into the office and sat me down and sacked me. But he didn't say why. He didn't explain anything. And he was a cold man anyway, and I was furious. We're talking now of the late 50s, early 60s, and, and we, people have changed a lot since then. And their mindset was not untypical of many men at that time. This is the BBC television service. We now present another programme in our series of experimental transmissions in colour. Early one morning, just as the sun was rising, I heard a maiden sing in the valley below. Oh, don't deceive me, oh, never leave me. How could you use a poor maiden's song? One's a bit green in the shadows on the left. Is that shading? Yes, we'll have to change the green tube tomorrow. You mean today, don't you? The 50s was an era of opportunity in television. There's no doubt about that. It was an expanding, booming business, lots of jobs going, and no guidelines, no rules about how you did things. So lots of bright people were experimenting. But the 50s was still a very conventional society. And the changes that came in the 60s, which are often now regretted were marvellously liberating for the constraints and to some extent the hypocrisy of society in the 50s where you know there were very few divorces but there were plenty of unhappy marriages in the 60s people talked about that sort of thing and it's fair to say that Carlton Green headed a BBC that was full of very bright creative people it's also probably true to say that of those people women perhaps didn't get their share of the breaks that men did. Oh, isn't it lovely? Yes, fishy. Oh, honestly, it was so romantic. There we were, sitting there in the dark, and all of a sudden he threw away his orange aid carton and said, let's get married right in the middle of the forthcoming attraction. <laughs> oh, I went 
very quiet week, you know. <laughs> we fixed the wedding for tomorrow. My Bill don't like long engagements. No, he can't do. And he proposed last night. <laughs> He's a bit of a isn't he? Oh, Paddy, will you break it up? Come on, girls, get back to work, please. Would you mind you interrupting a union meeting? <laughs> and as the executive committee, we are perfectly entitled to concern ourselves with a brother who's about to become a bride. Another look, love. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I know he brought it back from Hong Kong. So romantic. <laughs> oh, Jesus. It was the most unprepossessing idea a factory where people made clothes you know when i was when it was suggested i thought oh god that sounds really dreary but this tribe of women using their power and actually dominating the men i mean peter jones and reg varney got totally shat on from a big height by all the women in the show and i think maybe women that watched rejoiced in that if we think of the public world, of work, of parliament, of politics, that's what's deemed to be important. Whereas the private wor world of relationships, marriage, domest domesticity, is seen to be a bit trivial, a bit over-emotional. Now, what soaps do is to turn that round and say, actually, we live in the domestic sphere, and the, therefore the plots of soaps are nearly always about relationships, about how to behave in relationships about how to handle love, marriage, death, children. And you can turn that thing off to start. And don't all stand gawping at me, I'll live here. We know. Did you say something, Mrs. Tanner? Yes, I did, Mrs. Sharples. And while I'm about it, I'll say something else. It's bad enough being chucked out of your house and having to stay the night here is a damn start worse. But when you start chucking your flaming waste about, that's the limit. And if we want a bit of music, we shall have a bit of music. Oh, will you? We'll see about that. Were you wanting something, Mrs. Sharples? Because if you were, we might get the idea that we're not welcome here. And if we did get that idea, you wouldn't be welcome at our house. If that thing disturbs me in the vestry, I'm having the police in. And don't you get big-headed Jack Walker. I can soon find myself another pub. <laughs> <laughs> See, I enjoyed that. Come on, let's show her. Roll out the barrel. Let's have Shut a... up. The striking thing about the women in Coronation Street is that they cover such a wide range of character and age. So that, for, on the one hand, you get Ina and her cronies sitting in the snug in the Rovers' Return. These women in their 70s, very unusual to get that on television. Then you have Elsie Tanner as the siren of the street, very down-to-earth, sexual, um, dramatic in the way in which she speaks and engages with life. We have Annie Walker, who's trying to be a bit better than she should be, who's always looking down her nose at Elsie and her goings-on. And then we get the younger women characters who are kind of almost being groomed to take over those matriarchal roles. So you get those contrasts in the characters of the women. But at the same time, you get a very strong sense of solidarity when it comes down to it. I think soaps give to women a particular pleasure, which is about seeing strong women characters, characters whom they get to know quite well because they're on so frequently over such long periods, who are battling with the same kind of problems and the same issues that women are facing in their own lives. I mean, I seem to remember the BBC at that time was run entirely by people who'd come out of the services. Everybody seemed to be commander this or general that or something. And it was a male club, rather like Parliament is still, um, you know, there were all these blokes and they gave, you know, they elevated one another and some woman might come in and frighten the horses, I suspect. I had aspirations to direct. Um, Sidney Newman had gone to the BBC as head of drama. And I, one day I got a call from him saying, um, what do you know about children? Well, since I was unmarried and had no children, I said, absolutely nothing at all, Sidney. He said, well, I've got this new children's series that we're starting in the drama department. And, and I want you to come and, and be interviewed by someone as a possible producer. And that was Doctor Who. I was 27 and I was younger than any of the other producers who were all male in the drama department. 
And um, there were a lot of people, I think, who, for various reasons, which had nothing to do with me, didn't particularly want it to work. It was thought, with, with some justification, because I was an inexperienced producer, that the first director should be a director of some experience, and they put a very experienced director on, who took one look at me, I think, and decided that, that he would do everything the way he wanted to, and I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't say anything, and, which was his first mistake, really, his only mistake. Um, and when he realized that, that I had strong opinions, which did not necessarily uh, uh, fall in with his, um, he asked to be removed, which was terrific, really. <laughs> the special effects department were quite supportive, except they didn't have any time to do in the special effects. But they did find some outside people who were very, very supportive. But we had most problem with the design department, who were very unsupportive. They basically, I, I think, had an attitude that who was this woman, this young woman, who probably didn't know anything and who would, you know, who they really were just going to palm off with any second-rate stuff. And, of course, we ha I did have the most awful hour with them. I'm of the generation that had accepted a lot of things about women, um, about keeping my place and little girls should be seen and not heard. I mean, it's unbelievable coming from me now, but it was true. Um, and the superiority of men and all those sort of things. I just subconsciously accepted, I really did, that I, I just accepted that men were in charge. Um, when I was young, it was the vicar and all people of s superior intellect, like teachers and people who were better than me, you know, everybody was better than me, it seemed. And you should try and be pretty and attractive and accommodating and all those things. <laughs> Cal is dead. I give you fire. I am leader. BBC Two. Program start in five minutes. Because of the expansion of television in the 60s, there was, of course, a quantum leap in the number of jobs, but also in the hierarchy. I mean, we now, the BBC, had two controllers, controller one and controller two. We had a whole um, series of programme departments, which each had a head bidding to put programmes on the channels. We had the upper management who were running resources and uh, finance and planning and so on. So there were lots more opportunities and there were the beginning of a dense bureaucracy. In, that, in the middle of all that, women were seizing opportunities. I mean, you had someone like Esther Ranson who arrived at Man Alive as a researcher and seized the opportunity to make a prosperous career within one whole programme strand. Uh, which she has stayed with throughout her career with enormous success. Biddy Baxter was another one who arrived in children's programmes and became the sort of the darling mother of Blue Peter for years and years and years. What had happened was that Blue Peter had been produced by a man called John Hunter Blair and he started this 15-minute programme which was trains for the boys and dolls for the girls. Then he became ill and the programme was tossed around from producer to producer. I mean, if you came to the end of a drama series, you did a few weeks on Blue Peter, which was very bad for the programme. About three months before I joined, a man called Leonard Chase and Edward Barnes had taken it over, and they'd begun to pull it together. So it was in slightly better nick when I arrived than it had been before, but it still needed an awful lot doing to it. Monica joined... And she was a Hugh Weldon appointment, and there was a huge feeling of optimism in the department. We really all felt that we were going places. Well, I had a board, and they, I, say, I actually said, I, I'm not quite sure why I'm here, because I really have never done children's programmes. And I remember Hugh saying to me, you've been a child, haven't you? That is one of the problems for children's programmes producers because everybody who's been a child, even if they haven't had children of their own, feels they know how they should be done because of their own personal experiences.
Some of the programmes were very out of date and old fashioned in style and attitudes. The wooden tops, for instance, still had a live in maid. There was Mummy Wooden Top and the baby, and Daddy Wooden Top. Then there were Willie and Jenny the twins, and Mrs. Scrubbit, who comes to help Mummy Wooden Top, and Sam, who helps Daddy Wooden Top. And last of all, the very biggest spotty dog you ever did see. Hello. Hello. And if our visitor could talk, he'd probably say hello too. You probably remember that on Thursday I said we'd be having, uh, or introducing you to Daniel. So let me introduce you to Daniel. This is Daniel. He's the first baby we've ever had on Blue Peter. At the beginning, uh, when there were just two presenters, obviously it was a girl and a boy. Um, later on, sometimes it was two boys and a girl, sometimes the other way around. It all depended on the talents of the presenters we had. Uh, but we always, always, always had role reversal. It was very important. When we pioneered, we were the first programme to have a baby on the programme for the first three years of its life, Daniel. And I was certainly not going to let Daniel ever be seen with Valerie Singleton because any macho seven or eight year old boy would have switched off. So Daniel belonged to Peter Purvis and John Noakes. And that was absolutely fascinating because Peter Purvis hated it. He hated the items because where he came from in the north, if a man pushed a pram, he was emasculated. John Noakes, on the other hand, saw the comedy potential and went for it. As Daniel still didn't know what to make of the truck, I tried moving the top to show him that it rattled. But he seemed to like John's funny faces best of all. The management have always thought that uh, women uh, could do no harm in children's programmes. Therefore, children's programmes was a good, safe place to have a woman as a head of department, and the same applied to schools, because it's a management SOP. I was the only woman for a time at the weekly programme review board that I used to attend, and there were all these amazing men who were heads of departments and controllers and so on, who I thought were all brilliant. And I used to listen to their conversation about programmes with some, all, and for some time didn't actually bring myself to say anything at all. But eventually I did, and they all looked rather surprised. And they obviously were surprised that I would occasionally dare to criticise some of the evening output. They didn't think that was anything to do with me. But I thought it was quite important that I should react um, to the programmes that were being discussed, and occasionally did. I must say, if you are the only woman in a large gathering of males, they can't help noticing your voice, even if they don't agree with what you're actually saying. It's hard nowadays, with the assumptions we all make that isms were around ideologies and theses, feminism and so on, to re recall that in the 60s it wasn't that organised. There was a general sense, of course, because women had been at universities for years and wanted jobs and careers, but there, there hadn't been the formulation of the 70s feminism at all. The theses hadn't been written. The ideology hadn't been established. The cases weren't made. There was no such thing as women's studies at universities. All that came with the 70s and had a huge impact because now, instead of people knocking one by one on doors and saying, could I have a job and how do I get on in television, suddenly there was a case being made in society for um, equality with men. You know, it's the whole thing between the sexes, isn't it? That if you are a man who depends on your kind of superiority and being able to manipulate and control and all those things, and one of the things that you are used, particularly in your private life, to doing that too, suddenly turns around and bites you, um, it's very difficult. I mean, I'm always very sympathetic for men who have that problem. Three pounds isn't much to pay for something different every day.